introduce our first speaker, which is Richmond Sapa. So Richmond has got a, a great record of uh, applying CH functionalization towards uh, new strategies for synthesis. He's actually a member of the center and has been a great contributor to the center. And uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing his talk. The title is Applications of CH Functionalization to the Synthesis of Alkalites. Uh, welcome, Richmond. Thank you very much, Hugh, for a, a really nice and generous introduction, as usual. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be invited to be a part of this uh, symposium. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm honored to serve as the warm up act uh, for the three fantastic talks that will follow this one. Um, so, what I thought I would do today is really just sort of give you a sense for how we approach the synthesis of complex molecules uh, by applying CH functionalization, uh, particularly to the synthesis of uh, alkaloid uh, natural products. And so, uh, I think this uh, class of natural products known as alkaloids doesn't really need an introduction. And so, uh, if we go to the next slide, I give a small sampling of secondary metabolites. And uh, for most natural products, they're characterized on the basis of their structure. And uh, that is true, for example, of the terpenoids, um, whereas alkaloids are particularly characterized by their reactivity, and in particular, uh, the fact that they possess these uh, basic nitrogen functional groups. And uh, if we advance, uh, you'll see that this is true for uh, the three structures that I show on the bottom of the slide. And what is also true for a large subset of natural products is that they are topologically complex, uh, meaning that they possess uh, a high degree of architectural complexity. And this is also true for a large number of uh, alkaloids that possess basic nitrogens. Um, and the fact that they, can, uh, they possess this topological complexity uh, is important in terms of how one would think about a de novo way to achieve their syntheses. And so if we go to the next slide, if you're thinking about a de novo way to prepare these types of structures, uh, strategy becomes a very important part of that consideration um, for a large number of molecules, for example, polyketides or peptide. Uh, in those cases, an iterative, uh, an iterative approach uh, would make more sense, whereas for these topologically complex compounds, a strategic approach makes the most sense. And so, in terms of thinking about how one would apply strategy to the synthesis of not only alkaloids, but all uh, uh, topologically complex secondary metabolites, uh, one needs to think about several principles that will guide the types of strategies that one adopts. And so, for example, uh, there's interest in exploiting functional groups that are inherent in a target. And obviously, this is very much apropos with respect to CH functionalization, uh, because there are a large number of CH groups in these organic structures. And so we would like to take advantage of these uh, in terms of building uh, complexity. We also look for elements of symmetry uh, that might be resident, uh, or in some cases, not so obvious uh, in these structures to enable us to simplify um, the analysis of how to prepare these molecules as we work in a retrosynthetic direction. And I'll present some examples of that. And today I'm talking about alkaloids and secondary metabolites, which are uh, termed natural products. And so in many cases, uh, there is some insight into the biosynthesis of these types of compounds. And so uh, in, in, in some examples, we look to learn from nature about how we might be able to put these molecules together by adopting a biomimetic approach. And then uh, finally, uh, we are interested in, in, in unusual uh, uh, ways of uh, approaching the synthesis of these molecules uh, to achieve maximal simplification in the retrosynthetic direction. So in some cases, we adopt uh, what uh, was introduced by E.J. Corey uh, long ago in 1975, this idea of what is termed a topological disconnection network analysis to approach some of these targets. All right, and so clearly strategy is very important in terms of how we think about molecules. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, it's quite obvious that in order to implement a strategy, one needs powerful bond forming or in some cases bond breaking methods. Um, and methods certainly are a very important uh, aspect of building complex molecules. And CH functionalization has certainly revolutionized uh, the way in which we think about complex molecule synthesis by making possible new disconnections 
um, and therefore new strategies for thinking about how to prepare molecules. And so if we advance one, um, it's uh, quite obvious that uh, if one can achieve a direct carbon nitrogen or carbon carbon bond formation, uh, this could powerfully simplify the way in which we approach the synthesis of natural products in general, uh, but I believe particularly of alkaloids, especially when we think about carbon nitrogen bond formation. All right, so um, on the next slide, uh, what I wanted to do today is sort of start uh, with a little bit of an overview of how we sort of have evolved in our thinking about building complex molecules and how seed functionalization has played an especially important role in terms of how we thought about a number of alkaloids. And so I'll start with the three uh, which are in the blue box, uh, which is work that has come before, and I'll finish up uh, with, a, with a new synthesis uh, of this uh, albeit modest target called herb indole B. And so if we move to the next slide, just wanted to briefly uh, introduce to you how we first got interested in this idea of a direct CH functionalization, um, more in a traditional sense, um, but one that really was enabling in terms of a synthesis of this molecule called Lyconidin A. And so on the bottom right corner of this uh, slide I show uh, the structure of this compound like A, and uh, this is a molecule where at a late stage we were able to prepare the compound on the top left um, in terms of our synthesis and what we required at that stage was a way to forge a carbon nitrogen bond uh, which I've highlighted in red and so we looked at a plethora of reactions uh, which the literature might suggest would enable us to do this and we were never successful and ultimately we found that we could do this using what I would describe as rather harsh conditions uh, where we used n butyl lithium um, and iodine to achieve what is formally uh, a net dehydrogenation, uh, formally an oxidative CN bond forming process. And this actually really sensitized us to the fact that despite the sort of powerful methods for CN bond formation, especially to carbon uh, sp3 functionalized uh, 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 atoms, uh, there's actually quite a dearth of methods when it comes to using NN dialkyl secondary amines to achieve a direct CN bond formation to sp3 CH bonds. And so even to this day, uh, there really isn't uh, another method that can achieve this type of bond formation. Uh, some of you uh, certainly be aware of the, of the beautiful uh, contributions from uh, Professor Justin Dubois' laboratory, uh, where in, in, in some of those cases, uh, one can, uh, can use uh, nitrogens bearing uh, electron withdrawing groups to achieve these types of direct bond forming reactions. Um, recently, Matthew Gaunt's laboratory has published some nice work where if one possesses uh, uh, substituents alpha to the nitrogen, one can achieve these types of bond forming reactions using uh, palladium catalysis. However, in these cases where there, there are hydrogens at the alpha position, that's not possible. And so this is still an area where I think it's, uh, it's really ripe for development. And so this is uh, something that uh, uh, we are interested in, have been uh, looking at in my laboratory. And so related to this, we recognize that this is a very powerful way to make a carbon nitrogen bond. Um, and so we've sort of uh, looked to this uh, in the context of other alkaloids. And so if you go to the next slide, we also showed uh, en route to this molecule called arbofluorine, which is on the bottom right of the slide, uh, that one can achieve uh, in this particular case a transannular uh, CN bond formation uh, between uh, a, a pyridyl uh, moiety and this uh, NN dialkyl secondary amine uh, using a variant of, of the sort of Huff, uh, Huffman Leffler Freytag reaction. Uh, to achieve this direct uh, bond formation where we're exploiting the functional groups which are inherent in that target. And so the two cases I've described thus far are examples of carbon nitrogen bond formation which is certainly uh, appropriate in the context of building alkaloids. Uh, we have also been interested in carbon carbon bond formation and route to alkaloids. So if one goes to the next slide, um, in particular we've been uh, interested in uh, achieve in site-selective ways to functionalize uh, pyridine moieties uh, en route to the synthesis of, uh, of uh, secondary metabolites. And so on the bottom right, I show the structure of the molecule called complanidin, 
which has two, essentially two units uh, on the on the left and on the right, which are uh, uh, the same. And so this is a molecule that is a dimer, uh, but it's a pseudo symmetric dimer. And so we had to think about a way to prepare this from a, a particular monomer. Um, and we were interested in exploiting the inherent reactivity and selectivity that one can achieve uh, using this pyridine group. And so if you look in the top left, uh, we have uh, this uh, tetracycle that we were able to access uh, readily in uh, in four steps, and then applying uh, this uh, very uh, powerful uh, borrelation chemistry uh, introduced uh, uh, by Mitch Smith, uh, Maleshka, uh, Hartwig, and Miura, uh, we were able to achieve a site selective borrelation, uh, which then set the stage for Suzuki cross coupling to ultimately achieve a synthesis of this molecule. And so these three examples that I've described thus far, if we move to the next slide, uh, really set the stage for us in terms of really appreciating the power of CH functionalization, uh, uh, either in traditional terms or also using uh, transition metals to achieve much more functional group tolerant functionalizations, um, and thinking about ways in which we can now apply these to the syntheses of a range of other molecules. And particularly, we were excited about the idea of a direct CN bond formation, um, especially to sp3CH bonds, which could introduce a completely uh, different way of looking at the synthesis of a uh, subset of alkaloids. And so in the context of, of, of uh, this sort of uh, thinking, we've been interested in the synthesis of uh, molecules related to this compound here known as herb indole B. So if you go to the next slide, Herb indole B is a member of, uh, of a larger family of uh, these uh, indole alkaloids and their derivatives. And so in the sort of uh, bottom structure, you can sort of see that isotin uh, derivative, which is sort of the vestige of the indole uh, moiety. Um, and these are rather modest targets. And so they really serve uh, as a platform to uh, really showcase um, new methods, in my opinion, and they've been uh, a number of preparations of these molecules. Uh, what is particularly intriguing uh, to us in our laboratory was the fact that uh, the whole benzenoid portion of the indole is completely substituted in these molecules. And perhaps even more intriguing was the fact that one could recognize an element of symmetry uh, that is latent in these structures. Um, and so we wanted to take advantage of, of this uh, sort of symmetry element in identifying a strategy that uh, hopefully would uh, uh, provide a short synthesis of these types of molecules. And so if you go to the next slide, uh, thinking about this sort of latent symmetry, we thought that these molecules could in principle arise from a precursor, such as the one shown in the top right uh, of the slide, where in the forward sense, uh, one would be thinking about a direct oxidative CN bond formation uh, between this ortho ethyl uh, substituent and the aniline group. And in turn, uh, the structure on the top right would arise from a precursor, which would be this hydroquinone that's shown on the bottom right. Um, and that hydroquinone would be meso. And so that would provide opportunities uh, to achieve a meso disymmetrization and route to compounds like herb indole B and cis trichentrin, uh, which are uh, pseudo enantiomeric. In turn, that hydroquinone could arise from uh, three components that are shown on the bottom left uh, via a, a two plus two plus one plus one uh, cycle addition that would forge the hydroquinone in the forward sense, building on some beautiful chemistry introduced by Mitsudo's group uh, in the late 90s. And so this required the preparation of a sort of dihydroxylated uh, norbornadiene uh, a, a compound. And so in terms of preparing that, that could be accessed in a, in a, in a sort of direct uh, way. So if you go to the next slide, one can begin with uh, norbornadiene and effect uh, dihydroxylation uh, from the convex face um, and then follow that up with an acetylization and that provided the exo compound. Alternatively, if you advance one, uh, one can carry out a cycle addition of cyclopentadiene and uh, vinyl carbonate uh, to arrive at the endo uh, diastereomer um, and uh, 
hydrolysis then led to the endoacetal uh, compound. And uh, on the bottom uh, scheme here, I've just shown the uh, 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 cycle addition. This still uh, requires optimization, but we can process many grams of material uh, beginning with the alkyne and it's subjected to the conditions as shown. Uh, one can indeed achieve the formation of this hydroquinone in ready fashion. And so with that in hand, we advance to the next slide. We're now in position uh, to look at sequential uh, uh, derivatization of this hydroquinone. And so we began with a triflation, which could be achieved under standard conditions. And it was really at this stage that one gains an appreciation that uh, this really is the enantiodetermining step of the synthesis. And so if we advance one, that was sort of what we were thinking. Um, so if we can advance one, yeah, so we, we thought of this as the potentially uh, enantiodeterminant step. And again, if we advance, uh, we thought this presented opportunities where we can think about breaking the mesosymmetry by uh, some type of sulfonation or acylation reaction. Now, these types of enantioselective uh, sulfonations are, are actually, actually uh, uh, quite few, uh, whereas there's a lot more precedent for enantioselective uh, acylations, uh, famously the work of Scott Miller, uh, Vladimir Berman, and also Andrew Smith at uh, St. Andrews University. Um, and we certainly uh, looked at a number of, uh, of these catalysts uh, for sulfonation, and in fact, have been collaborating with Scott Miller's laboratory at Yale uh, to look at uh, a variety of sulfonations. There is some promise there, but uh, perhaps not as promising as we would hope. Uh, in terms of the sulfonations, whereas acylations work well. And so just as a proof of concept, uh, we've looked more at the uh, uh, Smith and Berman type uh, uh, nucleophilic uh, acylation catalysts and sulfonation catalysts um, and just uh, sort of promising uh, results. So if we advance one slide, uh, what we found is that uh, using a stoichiometric amount of the Smith uh, nucleophilic uh, catalyst, for these sulfonations, we can achieve uh, uh, sort of modest results. And so this really is a proof of concept. It's using stoichiometric amounts, but it's recoverable and we can uh, reuse it, um, but promising in terms of where we would like to go. Um, and so right now we're looking at things in racemic sense. So if we advance one, one slide, and so with this triplet in hand, we can then carry out a tosylation uh, to now uh, differentially activate uh, either phenol moiety. And so if we advance one slide, and so with that in hand, uh, we can carry out uh, sequential uh, cross couplings in essence. And so a hydrogenolysis formally of the triflate uh, uh, introduces the hydrogen. And at that stage, one can carry out cross coupling with uh, an ammonia <coughs> to afford um, the aniline uh, following uh, on the precedent of uh, Hartwig. Uh, alternatively, um, we can carry out, and so if we advance one slide, uh, stilly cross coupling to install a methyl group. Um, and again, the ammonia cross coupling to arrive at the aniline shown on the bottom right. And so uh, one can appreciate now that this uh, sequence provides access in principle. Uh, to what would be the trichentrin series or the herb indole series. And I've rendered these as enantiomers, um, but we've been doing this on the racemic material. But I do this to show how this maps onto these molecules. All right, and so if we advance to the next slide, um, this really set the stage for uh, what we wanted to achieve, which was uh, a, a, a bond formation between the aniline group and the orthoethyl substituent. And so this really became the key challenge of the synthesis and the place where we would be applying uh, a, truly uh, an unprecedented uh, CH functionalization uh, reaction to uh, forge this indolene uh, moiety. And we thought we had opportunities to do this on the basis of some very powerful methods that have been published from Jinquan Yu's laboratory. Uh, and in particular, we became interested in taking advantage of uh, uh, this uh, orthotolial type uh, substrates where the U laboratory has shown that one can achieve uh, CC bond formation uh, 
by uh, bringing together um, the, all the toluol unit and this pinnacle boronic ester. And this relies, if we advance one, uh, on the palidation uh, uh, directed by um, uh, the uh, uh, sulfonamide uh, group that is ortho to this uh, toluol uh, methyl group. Um, and, and of course, uh, if you're familiar with the work from the U laboratory, uh, the ligands are uh, particularly powerful in terms of uh, bringing success to these processes, uh, and this particular amino acid derivative uh, appears to be important. And so I won't belabor the point, but we tried uh, these conditions, and to our delight, what we find is that uh, a variant, a slight variant of these conditions actually affords not only the indoline, but actually achieves uh, a double oxidation in principle to afford the indole. Um, and this proceeds in reasonable yield over those two steps uh, to provide the compound shown on the bottom right. And so we've been thinking about how this type of process uh, occurs. Of course, uh, the U work uh, involved uh, functionalization at the benzylic position, uh, whereas in this particular case, it's unclear with the ethyl substituent whether that functionalization is to the benzylic position or to the terminal alkyl position. And so if we advance one slide, um, there are two potential uh, mechanisms that one can consider. Uh, the first shown here, which would involve sort of a terminal CH uh, activation uh, to afford a palata cycle, which following reductive elimination and a subsequent op oxidation would lead to that indole. Alternatively, if we advance one, uh, one can envision uh, very analogous to the Jinkwon U laboratory work, uh, benzylic oxidation, uh, rather benzylic activation followed by beta hydrate elimination to afford uh, a vinyl, an orthovinyl group, uh, which could potentially suffer a 5 endo trig formally uh, uh, type cyclization uh, facilitated by the palladium 2 species uh, to afford uh, a pi benzyl type. Uh, intermediate, which could undergo beta hydro elimination to afford the indole. And so these are just speculations in terms of mechanism. We haven't looked at mechanism in any detail. Um, this is where we're headed. Um, but just to move on to the next slide, uh, but our access to this indole now affords uh, really what is formal synthesis of these molecules. Um, and so here we show this on, uh, on, on the compound, which has uh, you know, the complete benzenoid portion substituted. Uh, if we advance one, we've also shown that we can achieve this type of uh, bond formation and oxidation to the endole for the compound bearing uh, hydrogen at uh, what uh, would be uh, the C5 position with respect to the endole. Um, and uh, these now, in many ways, intercept uh, an intermediate applied by the Kerr laboratory in their synthesis of these compounds. And so if we advance one, uh, we make the uh, so triple uh, substituted compounds, whereas the, the Kerr laboratory prepared the tosyl substituted compounds and carried uh, this on to the synthesis of these molecules in five steps. All right, and so uh, if we advance uh, to the next slide. And so, you know, on the basis of, of sort of what I presented here, we really are optimistic and true believers that uh, uh, this sort of position selective, uh, especially sp3ch uh, nitrogen bond forming reactions, uh, really can provide a complementary way to think about the synthesis of these uh, these alkaloids. Um, and so, if we advance one place, we become really uh, interested in applying these same ideas to the synthesis of uh, other secondary metabolites. Uh, CC1065 is a an anti-tumor antibiotic that has really captured our imagination. Um, and components of that compound are also other secondary metabolites that have been isolated from elsewhere. So PDE1 and PDE2. And we envision that uh, we can, in principle, apply these same types of disconnections uh, uh, to the synthesis of these compounds. And that all of a sudden opens up completely new ways of thinking about access in these molecules. And so if you advance one place, now these molecules open themselves up to taking advantage of these types of symmetrical precursors to now achieve uh, in a sort of sequential way uh, the formation of the key components of these types of molecules. Work that is currently uh, 
uh, uh, we, we're starting to look at in our laboratory. All right, and so um, if we advance uh, one more slide, of course, we've tried to look at how we can generalize uh, these indoline and indole forming reactions. Uh, just our very initial look at this using the substrates that are shown on the top row uh, shows that this reaction is actually quite, uh, quite specific. And so the substrates that I'm showing on the top here actually have not been successful thus far in our hands, uh, which is a bit surprising, but we're certainly learning uh, more about this type of process. Um, some of you might be aware of the fact that one can start to form these types of indolines um, by using azides, aryl azides, uh, which would work, uh, for example, on the, for the compound on the top right. And in our hands, uh, this has not been successful, and that might give us some insight into the uh, mechanism by which these processes uh, proceed, um, but this is very preliminary. Uh, preliminary. Uh, we're also looking at other substitutions ortho to this uh, uh, activated uh, aniline group uh, to try to gain uh, some insight into the mechanism of these processes, but this is still very preliminary in our hands. Okay, and so if we advance one place. So this is uh, sort of what I wanted to share with you today. Um, we are uh, very interested in, in the ability to prepare these uh, uh, alkaloids, which bear these basic nitrogens, and we really believe that uh, the ability to directly form a C and bond, especially from uh, these sort of NN dialkyl amines, would uh, provide uh, an efficient way to access these molecules. Uh, I want to finish by thanking the students that have done this work. Uh, a lot of what I presented today has really been led by Raul Leal, who's uh, a graduate student here at Berkeley, uh, and he was uh, joined in that effort by uh, a postdoc, Carol Bischoff, uh, who looked at some of the uh, disymmetrization chemistry uh, and the preparation of some other substrates for the double CN bond forming processes. Uh, Dr. Shota Sawano is a postdoc in the group now, but actually worked and looked to optimize uh, some of the two plus two plus one plus one chemistry uh, during his time in our group um, as a visiting scholar before he joined us as a postdoc. And Christopher McAtee was an undergraduate who came to a laboratory as part of the uh, CCHF summer intern program and uh, is now a graduate student at the University of Michigan and he worked along with Raul Leal on uh, uh, many aspects of the synthesis. Uh, Eugene Lee is an undergraduate in our group uh, who's uh, worked along with Raul Leal and uh, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Anna Hurtley in, in the Scott Miller Laboratory at Yale and uh, with Professor Jin Kwon Yu's laboratory on aspects of how to uh, really uh, improve and optimize uh, the direct C and bond forming reaction that led to the indole formation. And so I wanted to finish up by uh, thanking all these folks, thanking you for attention, of course thanking the Center for CH Functionalization for funding our work, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. I can do the clapping. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Richmond. Uh, the, uh, I've got one question for you. It's coming from Sukbok Chang in, uh, in KAIST in Korea. And uh, believe it or not, I think there is over 40 people at KAIST at 6 in the morning joining this meeting, which is very impressive. So the Indeed. question is, any, any effects of using chiral ligands on the selectivity in the cyclization? Uh, like matched or mismatched react results? Right. Ab absolutely. Right. So this is, you know, this is something that uh, we, we are starting to look at, uh, as I mentioned, because our meso have only led to, uh, you know, modest levels of enantial selectivity, uh, that hasn't given us too much of an opportunity to look at that uh, with the match-mismatch uh, uh, sort of considerations in great detail. Uh, what I will say is that um, even in the cross-coupling to install the aniline, uh, we do notice that there are some subtle effects uh, where the competing formation of what would be uh, a secondary uh, amine where you get diarylation and so you first form the aniline and then you get a second cross coupling to form a secondary uh, aniline uh, that seems to have some dependence on the enantiomers and so we suspect that uh, there might be uh, an effect uh, once we work with enantio enriched material um, on that uh, cyclization and certainly because we're using racemic material 
and the ligands from Jinkwon Yu's group that were using are amino acids, which are enantio uh, enriched at the very least and probably enantio pure. Um, uh, that could lead us to maybe even higher levels of efficiency in that bond forming reaction. So these are things that we, we're looking we're looking at actively. So it's a very astute observation. Okay, excellent, Richmond, and thank you. It really demonstrating how one can think of entirely new strategies when it comes to a CH functionalization approach. And uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk.